Salut les copains, bienvenue sur la Water Sports Zone. <rire> J'ai été à la rencontre de Kyle Lenny, le waterman par excellence. On a parlé de windsurf, on a parlé de wing foil, on a parlé de surf, on a parlé de foil. Et donc, bah, si ça t'intéresse d'en de savoir un petit peu plus, de savoir par exemple quel est le water sport préféré de Kyle Lenny, et bah, reste avec nous, ça va être sympa. Salut les copains et bienvenue sur la Water Sport Zone, la chaîne des conseils et aussi maintenant des interviews sur les water sports. Si tu aimes ce genre de format, n'hésite pas à mettre un commentaire, un like, partager avec tes copains. C'est toujours un bon soutien pour moi, ça fait plaisir et puis ça donne une information pour savoir si je dois toujours continuer à faire ce type de, de contenu. Allez, c'est parti, je pense qu'il n'y a nul besoin de présenter Kyle Lenny. Je m'excuse par avance pour mon Franglish, mais euh, on y va. So Kai, since the time we met, you had a major change in your life since you are now a daddy. Mm -hmm. How is a daddy's life? Oh, I think the best thing ever is being a father. Uh, I could never have imagined how much you could love, you know, these little babies. And I have twin girls, so every day they're growing up. It's just been amazing. Um, before, I used to just, you know, only want to be on the water. But now I have a reason to be on land to yeah. be with my little baby girls and my family. Yeah, because today, maybe because of us, You didn't uh, went out sailing or, or in the water? Yeah, you so. know, I mean, if I can be on the water every single day, all day, that's what I would love to do. But, you know, having a new house, uh, having kids, you know, like the conditions aren't perfect today. So I had to do a little bit of life and uh, do a little bit of work on land. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing that there's going to be good swell in a couple of days. So when the waves are good, I'll be able to go back out. But Right now, it's just pretty flat, so uh, I didn't miss out on too much. So you put some uh, good points in the, in the box? Exactly. Well? <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. You know, you just like, if it's not pumping conditions, and I, I definitely want to get some good points with the wife and the babies and spend time with them. And uh, when the waves are good, then, you know, I can go out and not be worried that I've, you know, just abandoned my family. <laughs> And uh, back to business, the, um, the other classic is just uh, done a few, few days ago. But there are um, so many uh, good guys um, just dedicated to, um, to windsurfing all year long and uh, dreaming of um, doing, uh, winning it or doing a good result. And uh, you, you achieved a podium, congratulations. And how, how is it possible uh, to, um, to ride at such a level in every sport? You do. Um, you know, I think doing the Aloha Classic, it's one of my favorite events ever, mainly because the windsurfing community is some of the nicest, best people I've ever met. Um, the event has always been really fun, but it's iconic to Ho'okipa, you know, the gathering place as it is in English, you know. Um, but I've always wanted to win that event. And uh, this year came in third, which is my best result I've had in that event. And, you know, maybe if the waves were a little bit bigger, I would have had a better shot at it. But, uh, you know, being as good at all these sports as maybe I am, you know, being able to compete on a high level. Fortunately, all the uh, sports are, you know, crossover really well. If you kite surf, you have the experience of speed and surfing and jumping. And then that translates into windsurfing, which is surfing, you know, jumping. So... There's like a very similarity between all of them and very blessed here in Hawaii to have, especially here on Maui, to have such good conditions for every sport every day. So I can go out and practice every sport whenever I need to. There's no necessarily waiting for conditions. Although before the Aloha Classic this year, there was no wind for a month. And uh, I hadn't, it has been flat the entire summer. So didn't really get to practice at Okipa until two days before the event. And I was like, oh man, if I had a couple more days, I probably would have felt even better. But I've been windsurfing my whole life, so I wasn't worried at all. I'm like, well, you know, just go out and do what I do. I've sailed here my whole life and uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem. And so you compete sometimes in windsurf. You used to compete in uh, kite surfing as well, in uh, surfing too, in the big wave tour, and uh, sometimes in the QS as well. You are pretty good in uh, wing foiling. You are somehow part of um, 
how this sport is uh, growing, but you you didn't uh, compete yet in this sport. Uh, is there any reason or? Oh, um, I think it's just timing of not competing in uh, a world tour event for winging. I mean, the level is so exceptionally high and. I know if I practiced um, a little bit more, I think I could be very competitive and possibly win a winging event. But then it comes to choices, you know, and you can only compete in so many events because it takes being from Hawaii is the best thing ever, but it takes forever to get anywhere in the world. True. And so if I go to do a winging event, you know, that's like a two week whole thing. And then the training side, and then that takes away from big wave surfing, that takes away from the windsurfing. And, you know, Ideally, I want to compete in everything, and I hope one day they'll do uh, some winging events, a world tour events closer, you know, on the Pacific side. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if it was here in Hawaii or in California or just somewhere that it's a little more accessible, uh, for sure. I mean, I love competing in Europe as well, and you know, the timing in the future might work out. And it goes the same with kite surfing, trying to compete and stuff. Um, you know, I think coming out of COVID, there wasn't any events for a while and now everything's getting momentum and i think once the world tours all of them including stand-up paddling the windsurfing um you know winging everything um is kind of like more established again and now it is the last year uh i definitely would want to hop in some events and try to win something and what do you think about the um the evolution of the wing falling as a sport since uh, the, the start of the sport, like maybe three, three years ago? Oh, you know, it's crazy because, I mean, three years ago, um, or when I started, I believe it was like 2019 maybe, is like when I got my first wing from Ozone. And I remember seeing, it might have been Ken Winter out here from Duotone. He was, you know, just starting to wing or he was just starting to go up wind. And I saw that. I'm like, gosh, I should give that a try. Like, that looks fun. You know, it's kind of in between windsurfing and kiting. And when I did it, I hopped on my uh, SUP foil and just grabbed a two-meter wing at the time. No one knew what sizes to have. The first one Ozone ever made. And I went out, and I was, like, coming from windsurfing and kiting. And then, of course, doing all the foiling, it was really easy. And immediately, I'm like, I got to put foot straps on a smaller board and try to jump. And that was like the whole next thing was like jumping. And it was a different sensation to kiting or windsurf jumping. It was like in between both. With winging, you could jump and get that floaty feel, but you could glide forward like a windsurfer. Whereas kiting, you know, you always go yeah. downwind. And so that was cool. And then it was like inevitable that flips were going to come around. And I think it was during COVID, that's when I started doing the backflips and started doing forward loops, 360s. And I was like, oh my gosh. Thinking to myself, as soon as the european freestyle windsurfers get a hold of this the tricks are gonna go crazy and then that was right after i thought that um baltz Mueller got into it and he was just going crazy with all those freestyle tricks mm. and really winging seems like the ultimate wind water sport for europe uh especially on lakes because the wind is so gusty and light but with winging you only need five to six knots to go and I've seen them do tricks in no wind almost, you know, just to get going and doing the spins and stuff. And um, now the level's insane right now. Uh, so, you know, I still have a lot to learn in the sport. I think, you know, I could get a lot better at it. But yeah, it's a great sport. It's cool to see how far it's come. When uh, I asked my friend, what do you want to know about uh, Kailini before the interview? Mm -hmm. They all asked me, what is his uh, favorite water sport? Uh, it's a tough one to pick my favorite water sport, you know, because every time I do one, I've like fall in love with it. I feel like it's like asking somebody which finger on your hand you want to cut off. Like, I don't really want to cut any of them <laughs> off. I probably need my thumb more than I need my pinky. But then again, like, I want all my fingers. These are all the sports that I love to do. And, you know, the conditions are so good here in Hawaii that you know, I get to ride at the pinnacle of what the sport could be, windsurfing, the highest level. And, you know, I think right now, um, just riding big, big waves is my favorite. And maybe it's my favorite thing to do because it doesn't happen every day. You know, it's like I've been waiting to surf Jaws for like nine months. It's just been flat. And I'm like, oh, I just want some big waves, you know. And uh, there might not be a better feeling than being on a toe and surfboard 
inside a big barrel and then doing a big air. But I think toe and surfing is like um, the uh, all of the water sports put together. It's it's kiteboarding. It's the windsurfing. It's surfing. It's the foil. It's the foot straps. It's like toe and surfing feels like everything I've ever learned to go ride a big wave. It helps me. If I didn't do one of those sports, I wouldn't be as good at riding a big wave. So it just feels like, you know, you can't have a beautiful painting unless you use more than one color. And the canvas is a big wave. So I use all these sports to make it it, what it is, you know, my riding, my expression. Um, So, yeah, I think riding big waves are my favorite right now just because I never get to do it enough. Imagine today, like, it was like uh, 30 knots uh, sideshore. Mm-hmm. If we have had like um, waves, I don't know, yeah, three meters waves, sideshore. What, what, which part did you? In that case, the way I decide usually is like, um, you know, if it's competition ar- based around that. Like, if the conditions are really good for multiple sports, it's like, okay, what am I training for? Because I'm always training for something. So. Now that I just finished the Aloha Classic, I'm really stoked on windsurf. And I'm like, I think I can win the Aloha Classic next year. So what better time to train than when you have all the momentum? So if the waves were really good at Ho'okipa, I would probably go windsurfing right now. Just because I know that I could keep getting better. And I'm thinking about next year's Aloha Classic. I'm like, okay, it's 12 months away, but I'm thinking of that. Or like right now with surfing, I'm trying to get my surfing to a world-class level, one where I could win, you know, events in Challenger Series or uh, Qualifying Series. So so because it's one of my goals, I might choose surfing. But then again, if if nothing was going on and it was just a normal day, you know, I think about big wave surfing and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go kite surfing because I can go really fast like I'm on a big wave on a little tow board. And I can hit the lip going fast and I can imagine myself on a giant wave. So I can hit and do a, I don't know, 20 meter jump and do flips and pretend I just hit the lip at Jaws. So using my imagination, like, I don't know. I don't have a favorite one. It's just whatever I'm like, my goal is. Um, And so whatever one I get into, I like really push for a little bit. And uh, I try to do all the sports I can in a week for Mm -hmm. sure. If the conditions are good, I can do all the sports in one day, no problem. So I don't have to choose. I can just do them all. <laughs> and um, as you said, you like competition or maybe even you love competition. And how do you, um, do you feel about the fact that you are scored for your performance uh, in our water sport more, more than like um, ranked on the finish, finish line? Well, so I've competed in both racing style yeah. sports where if you're first over the line, undisputed, you won, right? And even then, people will, like, argue about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, the I love competition because it puts me in a real focused zone, and I feel like after every competition, I learn something and I get better. And so I love to compete because I just keep getting better. And that's my favorite thing is to just get better at the sports that I do. And it's a motivation, right? If I just go out to go have fun – there's not as much motivation to get like really better. You know, of course, for me, going out in the water and having fun is the number one, but learning and getting better is the most fun. Uh, so I use competition as like the kind of the furnace where, you know, the fire gets bigger. Yeah. Uh, but but then again, you know, it can be frustrating when you try to you try to ride for the judges. You're not riding for yourself. You know, my expression surfing is different than if I'm competing surfing. And, you know, when you think you get the score and you don't, or, you know, you go someplace else in the world and, you know, it's judges from that place, they're going to make it harder for you. Or you go against a world champion, it's always going to be harder to beat an established Mm -hmm. world champion. Um, But that's just part of the game. And as long as I go into each competition knowing it's this is the game, and not taking it too personally when I don't do well because, you know, for what other reason, you know, judging subjectivity. Um, it doesn't bother me. I just focus on my goal and then I'm like, I'm going to come back stronger, you know, because I hate giving up or quitting. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, no, I think like races are the best typically because you just know who wins at the end. Like, all right. But um, it sure feels good when you can go out in the waves and, or, or, you know, compete and come in and, and, you know, you're awarded with first place. You're like, oh, I was the best today, you know? Yeah. And still talking about the performance competition, what is the, the part of the, the part that you think the gear have um, in your performance? The more, as I get better at my athletic ability, the more I think that my gear has a bigger part to help me get better. You know, I was just windsurfing in the competition and I had a very specialized board, basically a surfboard with surfing fins. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to ride or get used to. You can't windsurf it. You got to really surf it. But I learned a lot in the competition and you know, the adjustments we've already made, I'm like, oh, I wish I had this board. I would have been better. But at the end of the day, when I go into a competition, I don't, I, th I tell myself, look, I can win on anything I ride. That's like a, my mental mm -hmm. thing. Like I could, if I'm confused which board to choose, oh, should it be this one? Oh, should it be that one? I could be like, I could win on both. So whatever, I don't even care. Just give me one. But the reality is, is if you pick the right board, I think you can, surf way better you can ride good like do more spray everything and it makes it easier to do the tricks yeah. like to do the goiters or to do the handle passes whatever it makes it easier when you have a really good gear um and i feel like i've lost competitions world championships because my gear wasn't super perfect and you know maybe it was me not testing it enough or maybe trying something new when I should have just rode what I'm comfortable with. Yeah. There's a million variables, but I'm pretty sure every single person that's ever competed in one world championships has probably thought the same. And most gold medals and championships have been won on inferior gear. You know, people have made the gear good. It wasn't the gear that made them good. So. The more sports you do, the, the more gear you have. I have a lot of gear. The time you have to, uh, to test it. Yeah, it's hard to test everything, you know, like to make sure you have everything perfect. And, uh, and then also waiting too, you know, it's like I work with the best people on all my equipment, but it still takes time. Yeah, so when sure. I get an idea and I'm like, I need it. And you have to wait two weeks, you know, maybe three weeks and you finally get it. And by that time, like there's no swell. You know, that's like testing big wave equipment is a nightmare because before the the uh, Aloha Classic, we had perfect big waves, like not giant, not Jaws, but like big outer reef, which was great for testing everything and working on new tricks. And I ended up breaking three boards that were prototypes and uh, I uh, I ended up ordering new boards. And when I got the new boards, now that's the waves like, are windy and it's flat. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can't test it. So the first time I ride some of these boards might be on a 50 to 60 foot day. I don't know. Mm. But that's just like, that's the best part of water sports though, is you just never know with the, uh, when, with the conditions. It makes it exciting. And I think everyone has seen on uh, your Instagram and internet, the picture of you in your garage just here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many boards you have, you own? Um, I have probably hundreds of boards. In this boardroom alone, probably like 80 or 90. Um, a lot of that is like extra backup boards, That's mainly for uh, surfing, you know, or big waves. Yeah. You need like a lot of backups because in those sports, you break a lot of boards. And mm -hmm. if I break a board, I need one immediately. Um, and so, and then a lot of boards um, I evolve out of, you know, is a good board for the time, but then no, it's no longer fits my size or something you know it's uh it's kind of like that and uh and so you know i i have a lot of boards and i'm lucky to keep getting boards but i'm always developing too so i'm trying to make the best equipment and the great thing working with someone like kt or quattro goya you know those sort of companies is the feedback i learn goes to them and then they make it into production and then other people can enjoy it too yeah. And by the way, what's your um, relationship with um, with uh, Quattro, Quattro uh, Goya and KT? Because back in the day, you like kind of uh, split from uh, doing the promotion of uh, one brand 
in uh, for equipment mm -hmm. but you look like you're a bit more close to to this brand so what, what's your relationship with them my relationship with keith tabool kt quattro is awesome um you know they're one of the few companies that can make everything that i ride you know like It's difficult when um, you know you do so many different sports. There's great shapers and designers in every sport, but they're very specialized. And if I can work with like, you know, more one shaper, then you know I can go to one person, and the, what we learn in the big wave boards can cross over to the uh, the small wave boards, the foil boards, and uh, all that sort of stuff. So. You know, I'm lucky that I get to ride whatever I want. I think um, the... Hey, Coda. That's my dog, Coda. Hey, 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 Coda. Settle down, Coda. Hello. <laughs> um, so anyway, to pick back up. No, like, I can ride whatever equipment I want, but I choose to ride KT and Quattro because, you know, they, they can make everything here on Maui in my backyard. I can... Yeah drive 15 minutes from my house to to their factory and we can design and work on stuff and i mean i what i love about my water sports besides just being the performance the athlete is designing and coming up with ideas oh how could we make it easier how could we make it better work on the fins do all that stuff and uh and that's the fun part so to be able to do it all the time is really cool but Usually if I see something really interesting, you know, that someone's using in the world, I'll reach out and be like, I'd love to try it, you know, because it's all about pushing my performance to be as best as I could possibly mm -hmm. be. Katie just released uh, the Gingsu, mm -hmm. which is uh, pretty different than what we used to see in yep. uh, the um, wing foil boards. And uh, have you been involved in the testing and development of this, of this one? And what do you think about it? Yeah, so we started testing the Ginsu a couple years ago now. And uh, to me, it's my favorite board. Absolutely my favorite because, you know, for winging especially, you can bounce off the water so quick. Or if I'm foiling the biggest wave I've ever ridden, you know, when you hit the water, you can bounce and all the drag, the air turbulence doesn't get stuck on the mast. And I've just noticed I can get up on foil much quicker. Um, so I really, really love the Ginsu design. That's my go-to board. Um, that's what I take around the world. And I like that it's like a new, unique design too that not a lot of people have experimented with. It's always fun to like make something unique and different and better in a way, um, or at least kind of geared to a certain performance. Uh, and that's like get up quicker. If I land in air, it'll bounce off the water better. Um, just try to get closer to that surfing feeling and yeah, the Ginsu is, yeah, that's, that's a board that I'm really proud to be a part of. And what's your board size quiver in the wing foiling? Uh, for wing foiling, I just use two boards. Um, I basically will, my go-to wing board I think is 30 liters. So here it's so windy, you don't need that big of a board, but I like a little more volume here for landing jumps or um in light wind days when the waves are big just to get up but i want a small board so that's you know 30 liters it's a four six and um it it rides amazing and then my prone board's a four four and that's 24 liters and then my light wind board gosh i think it's like around 42 liters for the winging um but uh yeah like i just have my go-to wing board that i always use And then I got my prone board that I always use. So basically just two. And uh, if you travel, you, you would take uh, a prone board and a wing foil board, or you can do both with, uh, with one? Um, usually I could wing on my uh, prone board, no problem. But if I go somewhere kind of light, then I'll bring both boards. Uh, the thing is, is um, you know, I usually will, will, if I have to choose one, I'll take my prone because it's a little smaller, which is better for just prone surfing. And then I'll bring just a bigger wing so I can have a little more juice to mm. get up on the smaller board. But yeah, ideally bring both, you know, because again, once you get really into the performance of each sport, you need specific things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like with winging, I use an 80 cm mast 
And with prone, I always use 70 cm mass because just the feeling, you know, I like the shorter mass when I'm prone because it feels tighter to the wave, more surfy, easier for tricks. Um, the 80 just feels good for weeing because you lean over a lot, you know, and, and you want that area to get the pop for mm -hmm. the flip and stuff. And you're going over bigger chop. Um, and then if I'm foiling a giant wave, 100 cm mast. And that feels short. Yeah. You need that clearance on a big wave because you're only kind of going straight or doing a big carve. You're not like doing crazy tricks, you know, because you're just trying to survive. About foils, I have the same question as a board. How, how many how many foil do you do you own? Um, I have pretty much almost every foil out there because I'm always trying to like figure out what's faster, what's this. But um, my friends and my brother. Ridge and my friend Carlos um, have this little design company called the Hydrofoil Company. And so I get custom foils from them and they're just insane. Like they may leave me these foils a 700 square CM, which is my favorite wing foil ever. Um, I can ride tiny waves on it, huge waves. I prone foil it. And then I have different sizes up to a 900, 1100, which I don't use that much. And then I have a 1300 if I go really light downwind and I'm trying to do tricks. The foil's like mid aspect, so it's meant for surfing feel. Yeah. And then I got some other high aspects for wing racing or um, for just going super fast downwind. Um, but my go to, if I had to have one wing only, my 700 Hydrofoil Company, and then maybe a 70 CM mast and a 80 CM mast is like. That's like, to. yeah, that, if I have to bring one foil yeah. in my suitcase when I travel, that one, it's That's one. so good. What is the uh, aspect ratio? I don't no. even know what the aspect ratio is. Like. So, so what do you look um, for in a foil? I mean, uh... um, I write, like, so for me, I really, my favorite foils are the ones that have a big range. High aspects are great, but they tend to, to turn like this, like yai, and they're awesome, they're fast, and they pump really good, but they don't have as much of the surfing feeling. And I don't know if many people want the surfing feeling, but for me, I'm trying to ride my full board like my short board. So I want that feeling where it's really rolly. So go with a mid aspect design in between, you know, two types of foils. It pumps good, really good low end. Like, for example, I could ride my 700 on a wave this big, or I could ride the 700 on a wave taller than the tree. Like, it goes as fast as I want to go. So it's very thin. It's pretty thin, yeah. But, I mean, those guys just designed the perfect foil. Like, really, it does everything really good. Yeah. Like, maybe there's foils that are faster, like, you know, because of the high aspect. But I don't think there's a foil that feels as high performance turns, airs, backflips. I mean, it makes doing flips so easy. You just kind of look and it just goes, whoop. And you just land. And you're like, oh, okay. When, when you are Kalini. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. If I look, nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, you just got to go, oh, here we go. Woo, flip. <laughs> you look like um, uh, ready for any sport, anytime, anywhere in the world. And what does it take, um, I mean, gear-wise, to, um, to achieve that? Have you got uh, always your board bag ready? Uh, have you got some uh, gear waiting for you in Europe? Or sometimes do you travel with all your gear? Or maybe you have a, you know, do you do choice? Or, or? I usually just travel with all my gear because all the equipment is evolving so fast that if I leave equipment somewhere in the world, by the time I go there, let's say six months, a year later, I'm like, ah, oh, this gear isn't as good as, you know, what I got at home again because we've already like mm. developed a better sale or, you know, it's not necessarily that it's better. It's just a different feeling that I'm chasing. And so normally I just travel with everything and I bring a lot of equipment and it's like I pull my hair out trying to figure out, okay, what do I need? I need this. Okay. I don't need that. Okay. I need this, you know, like, um, but you luckily look, look the forecast as well, maybe. I look at the forecast yeah. and I'm like, oh, it's like 50, 50 chance it's going to be windy. I'm like, okay, I bring one kite just in case, because if I don't bring anything, it's going to be windy. And if I bring wind equipment, there will be no wind. So it's like, it's trying to decide. I mean, I try to pack all my bags pretty light and the equipment nowadays is so light. So I put all just the main stuff in the big board bags. Then I have a suitcase with all the tools and everything. 
That way, when I'm traveling, it's easy to move everything. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like dragging something super heavy. And um, fortunately, people don't really steal windsurfing gear. So, you know, I can bring a ton of windsurf equipment. But, um, you know, going to like the hardest sport to travel for is probably for sure if you're doing a windsurfing World Cup because you have to bring so much equipment. But not even that, like trying to do big wave uh, surfing yeah, is the really worst rough. because you have to make sure your equipment shows up on time it's long you know you're traveling with up to a 10 foot four inch board and everything's heavy like my nazare toe boards are 10 kilos each so two board bags you know or two boards in a board bag you know you're up to like you're up to 20 kilos like immediately and yeah. it's just like you know just traveling with all that stuff it's like can i check it in you know and so i've left boards in nazare because they're, they weigh too much to always be like dragging back and forth um but already i have a newer boards that i'm gonna bring if I, the contest is on <laughs> so you bring some board but you don't bring them back i probably yeah. bring them back oh. yeah at some point um foil were not that well accepted on uh, every spot in the world uh-huh no it looks like it's more like uh, coming uh, into the mortality that could uh, fall pretty much uh, everywhere. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Well, it's funny because, I mean, every new sport usually gets hated on by the previous sports. Oh, foiling is so dangerous. And yeah, I guess it is. Like, you could run into somebody. But then again, if you run into somebody on a surfboard, it, those fins are sharp too. They're going to cut somebody up probably worse than a foil, you know, It's depending on the foil you have some foils are actually really blunt so it's like maybe a bruise but then again the foil was never meant to go to a crowded surf spot i always rode the foil to go ride waves where no one was around the mushiest softest faced wave that's perfect for the foil so i think people learning too that oh i don't need to go to the main surf spot with the foil like those kind of waves are will be fun but like Not the best for a foil. The foil is like a little slopier wave, mm. more white water, you know, so you can be more performance. But then again, so before everyone hated foils, everyone hated stand up. And before stand up, everyone hated long borders. So it's like people love to find things to hate. And, um, you know, for sure there's people that misuse the equipment and maybe upset other people. Mm going through a crowded lineup on a kite or dropping a kite on somebody or even just whatever, you know, like, um, and, and so if everyone just, it stays more respectful, there's no problems, but not everybody is as respectful. They just don't have the knowledge and mm. sometimes takes getting yelled at by somebody to learn, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, so You know, I just try to do my sports in the appropriate places at the right times. If it looks like it's good windsurfing, but there's too many surfers out, probably won't go windsurfing because it's just not the right time. You know, I'll go somebody, someplace else. And doing uh, all water sports at such a level, you, you promote the waterman uh, lifestyle. I mean, uh, like uh, no one uh, before. And in the other end, the windsurf community, the surfing community, the kitesurfing community, they are all like in some of uh, boxes, you know, or at, even in Europe, it's a bit like that. I think you are kind of the meeting point of uh, all the community because you, you have fun in every sport. And uh, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, that's what I love about doing all these sports more than just doing different sports is you, the communities or the tribes. You, know, you got the wind surfers here, you got the kite surfers here, you got the surfers, the foilers, the stand up paddlers, the big wave guys. It's like I can kind of like, it's like going over to somebody's house for dinner and hearing all the stories, you know? I think they're the, in each sport, the athletes are incredible and I look up to every single one of them. You know, if I go with my friends that are the best kiteboarders in the world, I'm like, oh, I want to try that. That looks awesome. And, uh, or if it's big wave surfers, you know, it's like, Oh, I if he could catch a big wave like that, I'm going to catch a big wave like that. And so it's like, it's just the whole process of learning. I've realized that I just love learning so much and I learn a lot. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're just trying to have fun. Like, why are you doing these sports if you're not having fun? So if I can, you know, experience all the fun of these sports and, 
you know, maybe inspire other people to do the same because, you know, not because of how good I am at something, maybe just because like, hey, look how much fun I'm having. And I understand the sports can be quite expensive, but, um, you know, there's very few things in life that, you know, don't cost, you know, a lot. If you want to have a nice car and feel good about driving this nice car, it costs something, you know, and um, working hard to achieve that. Before I was sponsored and, you know, um, my parents really taught me to work hard and to earn, you know, the proper way so that I could afford all my equipment. So with all my equipment, I, if I break a board, it's not like, ah, whatever, I'll get a new one. It's like, oh my gosh, I sometimes I'm like hard to get over my board. I'm like, oh, it was so nice. Like, oh no, it's scratched. You know, like I really care for my equipment as if I like, you know, worked another job completely in order to get it. So I have a lot of respect for the sports I do because I appreciate the equipment that is designed and the cost of it. Um, you know, overall, I'm just grateful to do it all and to hang out with all my friends in all the different sports because... You know, that's what life's all about is, you know, being with a community and, and learning, you know, and I get to be with a lot of them. And um, you know, how is it in Hawaii about the different community and tribes? Um, I mean, um, when you are surfing, does the surfers uh, look at you as a windsurfer or kiter or do they consider you re uh, actual surfers? I mean, most mm -hmm. of the shortboard because in big wave it may be different. But. I think, you know, Maybe 10 years ago or five years ago, surfers probably would have looked at me as just a windsurfer or a stand-up paddler or something. I think I've been putting in my time for long enough that most surfers see me as a surfer too, or you know, mainly as a surfer. And uh, you know, that feels cool. Um, you know, I think you know here in Hawaii, there's spots that are only surf spots. You can't stand a paddle. You can't foil. Um, you can't do other sports there and that's fine you know there's only so many good surf spots I think here on Maui there's a lot more good windsurf spots just because it's so windy everywhere and we got so many outer reefs that are accessible to a wind sport like winging kiting windsurfing or stand-up paddling um, so you know I my goal has always been you know when I first got into big wave riding I was not a big wave surfer But then I established myself as a big wave surfer. Won competitions, won awards. I feel like I'm respected as a big wave surfer. And with surfing, you know, I think I'm respected by my peers. I think there's some that don't consider me a surfer first, um, which is fine. I'm gonna keep proving to myself that I am by going over and surfing places like Pipeline, going surfing the gnarliest waves to prove to myself that I belong in any lineup in the world and uh, I want to do the best surfing in the world. So that's like a goal that I strive for every day. We will talk now about um, risk and uh, fear. Since uh -huh. you know you are a uh, daddy, as we said totally. previously. And uh, how do you, do, do you sometimes feel uh, fear? And uh, how do you deal with that and with uh, the risk? I mean, whenever I surf really big waves, it's scary, you know? There's the fear you could drown, you could get hit by a board, jet ski, you could could die right um but the way i always overcame risk uh the the fear of it and the risk of doing it is i always focused on the goal like what is it that i'm trying to achieve you know am i just trying to ride a wave okay that's step one just make the wave don't do anything just make it okay did that it's like okay and now i want to do a 360 on the wave all right like i'm just focusing on the 360 I'm not thinking about the wave. I'm not thinking that it's bigger than the trees, you know? I'm just imagining, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm thinking performance versus less like how gnarly it is. You know, I think old school mentality in big wave surfing was always like, I'm, this is like, we're surviving. For me, it's like, no, this is performance. Like, of course I want to ride the biggest wave ever ridden, but those waves kind of choose you. You don't just go out and just get lucky. Like, You try to catch the biggest wave ever, it's really hard to do um, because it's so like, there might be one or two opportunities anywhere in the world. But if I can ride a lot of big waves in a session, you know, I can do my performance and be like, okay, I want to bottom turn like I'm windsurfing and I want to top turn like I'm surfing and I want to do airs like I'm kiting, 
you know, and I want to go as fast like I'm foiling. And, uh, you know, I want to be able to survive like I'm body surfing, you know. It's, uh, so it's really focusing on the performance and the goals gets you past the fear. And then not focusing on others. Mm. When you see somebody fall on a big wave, you're like, oh my gosh, like that looks so gnarly. Or you see somebody do something insane and you're like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I'm like, I don't even care. I just focus, okay, like, what do I, what do I want to do out here? Like, I have a goal, okay. And I just, just stay focused in that. And then I just do my thing. And then it becomes easy. And then when you fall and you survive a wipeout, you're like, okay, I can live through this. <laughs> and you spend all year training. So I'm pretty confident I can handle any wave I put myself into. Granted, sometimes when it happens to you, you're like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> But now that I'm a dad, you know, I feel like it was like 50-50 road, like fork in the road. Like you could either be really scared about doing what I'm doing or I could just train harder and be smarter. And now I feel like I have a clearer mind and I feel better trained. I feel smarter. I'm not going to take unnecessary risk for no reason, you know, mm. just to go, just to go. It's more like, okay, like I know I can make it. And if I don't, I can survive, but that is, um, that's, I just train harder and better now. And, um, I have the best motivation in the world, which is our, which are my babies. <laughs> okay. Thanks guy. It's been, uh, such a good moment, a pleasure for me uh, to speak with you like this. No problem. And, uh, very happy to, to share that with, um, my audience. J'espère que ça vous a plu. Merci uh, beaucoup de votre fidélité. N'hésitez pas à partager, laisser un petit commentaire et puis à vous abonner à la chaîne si ce n'est pas déjà fait. Laissez un petit mot si vous aimez bien le format et que vous voulez que j'interviewe d'autres personnes. Et puis je vous remercie et à samedi pour une prochaine vidéo. Bye bye. Aloha.